The brethren confirmed my opinion of this pulpit, but it didn't, it didn't hinder them from preaching today. That's the good thing. We've had a, as Brother Joel would say, an epic day in, in the Word, and we certainly appreciate that and the opportunity to be here and for you to be here and the opportunity to, to see these things. Take your Bible and turn with me to Ephesians chapter number 6 because I'm, that's my, my text and I'll get to it eventually just so that you uh, know that that's what... It, when Des was preaching, I, I saw his... When I saw the brochure and I saw his topic, when I read it, I thought in my mind, the perils of Pauline. Yeah. Some of you did too. We, we talk about the Pauline epistles and, and, and the, the, the Pauline ministry. And a young person in our assembly some time ago said, isn't Pauline a lady's name? And I thought, well, maybe we should start talking about the epistles of the Apostle Paul. And uh, if you, those of you who are new Langy, you'd understand that. And, but the, the, it's, it's important not to misunderstand some of those things. So anyway, Des did a good job of making it clear that he was talking about the Apostle Paul and not uh, some lady named Pauline. And we appreciate that. You know, I, it, it's... it's um, Important. This this is always a meeting that uh, my wife and I look forward to. We used to have a uh, my son and his grandchild, his his children, which are our grandchildren that live down here. Now they live up there with us, so there's not much reason for us to come to Florida anymore, except for you guys. And uh, we appreciate the opportunity to do that. On the table in the corner over there, I brought some books and tapes and stuff. Everything on those CDs is on the internet for free. Okay, so we're not trying to sell stuff just to sell it. But if you wanted the, the CDs, MP3s, DVDs, they're there. And uh, there, there is a, a price to replace, replace the thing. The books there, anything I had to buy, you have to, I have to pay for them. But uh, our mailing list and so forth, as I just pointed out to you, if, if you're looking for something to listen to in your car as you sit in the storm that's coming. <laughs> I haven't seen the news in about a, almost a week. And you know, it is so liberating. It is absolutely wonderful to hear about something I didn't know about and not care about it either way. Because I can't make it, it don't make a lick of difference what I think about a storm coming. It's going, if it's going to come, it's going to come. And I'm not going to be able to get out there and stop it or anything or, or think that I even would want to. But don't you guys need your grass watered down here or something? I, we were out in Arizona about three weeks ago and they're having a terrible drought out in the, in the, the southwest. And... They were having a, the week we were there, it rained every day. Now in Phoenix, when it rains, it means maybe the ground might look like it had got sprinkled. It comes down, and before it hits the ground, it's usually gone. And when it doesn't, it comes down in a gully washer, and takes about 30 minutes, and then another 30 minutes, it's all gone. Of course, five people drowned in the, in the flash flood from it, but it's, you know, it rain out there is weird. We were there one time when my grandchildren were young, they were like, four years old, and we're riding in the car, and it rained, and you know, got, got, it just splashing on the windshield. And my grandson, Ricky, says, Daddy, what is that? Rain, what is that? You know, where we live in the Midwest, it's param up nor one more time, here it comes. So you get a lot of it. But they, got, they were getting six to 12 inches of snow now, if I tell you you're in Arizona and you, get, you, and you think Phoenix, you say, what? No, it's in the mountains. But that's what they needed because that's where the runoff comes from. So they were, they were happy. California was happy because Arizona got, got snow and eventually the runoff. He said, that, that's the way God, the ecology that God put together, it works that way. So if the storm comes, thank God for the fact that it'll keep going. Maybe it'll plague those folks up in Georgia. My wife is an Alabama fan. You'll understand what that means. <laughs> I wrote a note to tell you about something. I can't read my note. My wife is convinced nobody can read my handwriting, and now I think I can't either. Uh, we have conferences in the Midwest in the summertime. In April, we have a, have a great school of Bible meeting. It's always the last full weekend in April. And uh, last year, we, because of the uh, pandemic and the close downs in Illinois is very tightly regulated, um, we just had a pastor's conference for the pastors and their wives. And it was an outstanding time. And we're going to do that kind of thing again this year. 
even if we, because I don't know that we can actually have a, the, the, a larger meeting. But uh, I'd encourage you, if you have a pastor, to try to send him and his wife to that meeting because it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic thing. And it was, it was interesting. We had an afternoon, we had a, I had a Q&A panel, and the guys talked about what they did, how they managed the, the ministry through the, 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 the pandemic. And you might, you might not realize what kind of stress something like that places on the leadership of a local church. And uh, it, was, it was wonderful to see the, 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 uh, the wisdom that these, these young men had uh, as they go through. This meeting, and by the way, this is what I was thinking about saying, this meeting ha has been going on for a long time and it's wonderful for us to see folks. Uh, you know, sometime I only see you guys once a year with my wife is uh, Alan and Jean Frith sitting next to her. They're, they're from Alabama where we were in Selma uh, years ago. I mentioned our kids at camp. Her mom and dad gave the land for the camp, Pine View Bible Camp. And you get to see people that you haven't seen for years, decades in their case, and, and, and so forth. Some of you to renew, renew acquaintances that I, I've known and, and worked with all these years. There's some folks that, that, um, that aren't here. Uh, time and chance happen to all men the Bible says. And I've, I've said for many years, if the Lord tarries, the, problem, the thing you know out of Romans 8 is going to happen. You're going to get old, you're going to get sick, you're going to hurt, and you're going to die. That's the promise you have of living in a fallen creation. And if the Lord tarries, that'll happen to you. And one of the things that happens is it's harder to sit in these seats the, longer, the older you get. So what we need to do is fill them up with some younger people. You know, that kind of thing. But by the way, the brother that led the singing here, Mike, um, he's, from, he's from Shorewood. He's from our assembly. He was leading the singing when he left. One Sunday he was leading the singing, and the next week I got a note from him said, we're in Florida, and we're not coming back. <laughs> and it was, kind of a, it was kind of a shock and a rush deal for, for them to, where they had to move. And uh, so we miss, miss him and uh, his wife. She, she's real special. And uh, we, we put up with Mike. It's that way with so many guys. You put up with the, them to, to have the opportunity to be with their, you know, know their wives and fellowship with the wives and enjoy their wives. And Randy, it's absolutely, sure, it's absolutely true. And it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to, uh, uh, to have that kind of fellowship. One person that I just want to say I miss is Brother Willard Sussums. Willard's health is, keeps him from being able to do, do a lot of things that he would. Willard is one of my heroes. Uh, he, I met Willard in, in Tampa many years ago. I was down here at a meeting, and he was working with a brother over on the Tampa side, uh, Ken, trying to get a Grace Church going. Ken had come in to understand the right division, and Willard had. And we moved to Chicago. We were in Chicago then. And there was a little church on the south side of Chicago and called Willard up there to be a pastor. And he pastored that church for a number of years there. And, and we worked together and I got to know Willard and, and, and love him. Then there came a controversy about the Bible. And uh, Willard was one of the guys that stood up and said, no, here's the Bible, the King James Bible, and I'm gonna stand for it. And when it came time to be e either fish or cut bait, stand for it or get put out, he said, you're not gonna put me out, I'm gonna walk out. I'm going to stand for what I believe. And I watched him stand in front of a, 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 a conference of people, and he and three other brothers, and they said, no, here we stand. And uh, he, he, took, he took a great deal of, uh, when uh, Des was talking about persecution, he took a great deal of assaults on his character, on his person. People in the church that he pastored, people would come in behind, behind them and, and, and try to turn them on him. And you won't, you, won't, you won't know that just by knowing Willard if you hadn't known what he went through. He's a quiet guy, humble guy. He doesn't talk about those, you know, what he's done. It's like if you ever knew anybody that fought World War II and tried to get them to talk about what they did, they won't do it. We've got guys in our assembly that fought in Vietnam. You can't get them to talk about what happened. We've got guys that fought in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. You can't get them to stop talking about what they did. <laughs> You know, I, I'm teasing about that, but uh, I just, I miss, I, you know, I appreciate Willard and I, I just want to acknowledge the uh, missing him because uh, it, it's, it's, a, it, it, it's a privilege for me to uh, have the opportunity through the years to not just know men like that, but work with them and be able to stand shoulder to shoulder with them and have them stand shoulder to shoulder with you. 
And it's a great privilege. And you, you need to understand that. So those of you that know Willard, you need to know you're having a privilege that it won't always last. He'll be with the Lord one day, and you will too, and then you can fellowship for eternity. Uh, so anyway, I just, I just, I was thinking about that, thinking about him, and uh, how, how much I, you, you can appreciate somebody like that, and, and how much I do. We, the number of students from Grace School of Bible that are here too, and I, I want to acknowledge you and tell you hello. And I, you know, you see me more than I see you, but uh, I, I, I do appreciate the opportunity to be a part of, of your life and ministry. If you have questions, I'm here. I'm not going to seek you out and ask you if you have questions, but if you have questions and you need to talk about something, I'm here. I'm here for you, and I'll be here until I don't usually go to bed till one, one midnight, one, one thirty at night. So you won't keep me up tonight. Uh, my wife will go to bed, and she, she, she does that regularly. She knows how to take care of herself, and I, uh, <laughs> she, she uh, won't mind me talking with you. So if you have questions and things, you know, be sure to to get that done. Ephesians chapter six. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. As we look into these things, we just pray that we might have some insight that would encourage our hearts to, uh, to, to stand fast in the battle, the spiritual battle and warfare that we're a part of. We've heard about it today already, and uh, that we'll be able to, to take your word and, and apply it the way you designed it to be applied for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Our text is Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 17, where, where Paul talking about the whole armor of God <clears throat> that we're to take, in, take, take on. Verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Notice that's where your strength is. Notice he doesn't say be strong by the power of the Lord. Don't be, he doesn't say be strong by the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It's in the Lord that your strength is. It's in the Lord where your spiritual power is. It's not you being strengthened by him. It's you being in him and who he's made you in himself, in his grace, in his, in, 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 in who, who, who he is and who, the riches of his grace in Christ. Who he's made you in Christ is where your identity and where your strength is. Our strength, our empowerment, our usefulness is in the identity that God gives us when he makes us a member of the church, the body of Christ. The brother, uh, one of the brothers went over this morning. You're dead with him, crucified with him. I'm crucified with Christ. You're identified with him in his death and everything his death accomplished is yours because you are in him. You're buried with him by baptism in the death. That's not water. There's no water baptism puts you into death. People say, well, it's a, it's, that's not a symbolic. You're baptized into his death, buried with him. Listen, he's not in that tank when you got buried in water. Amen. All you got was wet. Amen. That's a baptism that puts you into Jesus Christ. That's a supernatural thing, dude. He's not here. He's in the third heaven. If he was standing here, you couldn't get in him. I mean, it's 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 all it's just it's borders on blasphemy. If you if I, I call it that, but I'll just let you say borders on it to make out like the city water system is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a, that's a that's a. I'm gonna move on so I don't stay get aggravated about it. But you can see I can get aggravated about it. You're raised with him to walk in newness of life. All that's real. But it sure is because of your identity. And you're no longer in Adam. And all the things that belong to Adam belong to you. Your history ends at Calvary. And you're put into Christ. you got a new history. Better than that, you got a new future. A new, that's where your strength is. And what Paul's done is he's taught about all about that up to this point in Ephesians. He's taught about your calling and your conduct. Now he's going to talk about your conflict. That comes because because the adversary don't like who you are. He doesn't like what God's made you as a member of the body. He doesn't like the body of Christ. There's your your wealth, who you are, your walk, and how your warfare. And he says in that verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness. And you realize there is a spiritual host of people that war against what we're doing, against who you are. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Now, standing is, I'm here, don't move. 
Withstanding is somebody's trying to push me off, push me away, move me off. Brother, this morning talking about football. I don't know anything about football much. I don't really care for football. I think it's a dumb game that adults play and people pay to watch. Now, I think that until I, my wife's favorite team, my wife has two favorite football teams. One's University of Alabama, the other's whoever's playing Notre Dame. And I guess third is whoever's playing Auburn. But uh, that's an inside, inside the state joke. But the whole thing is you try to push the other guy away and you gotta withstand. The adversary wants to, he can't defeat you because you're a part of a total victory program in Christ. His goal is to cause you not to stand in that identity. He wants to push you off and make you think you're somebody else, think your strength is somewhere else, your identity is somewhere that's, there's a, that's a spiritual warfare that takes place with, 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 with truth and error. So he says, here's the armor. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, where which you can, you, that, you should be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. All those pieces of armor, truth, that belt of truth. Take the, the flowing robes of, 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 of your, your life. I lost 50 pounds last year, and I was, my coats were, I could wrap myself in them. <laughs> you lose six inches on your waist, and you, you got to let, my wife said, you got to quit wrapping yourself in your coats. You got to go buy new ones. So she give away all my old ones, so I had to go buy new ones so that I wouldn't gain the weight back because I hate spending money on clothes. <laughs> and she wouldn't let me buy my new clothes at, at Goodwill, you know. That $6 coat that I've been wearing, it's gone, and now I've got a, more, a much more expensive coat. That robe that they wore, cinch it under the belt, get your life tied down held together with truth, righteousness, the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ, peace. You know how important it is just to be at peace? You've heard these guys today talk about uh, the, the, the ability to look at life, contentment, tranquility of heart in the midst of a battle, the shield of faith, fighting the good fight of faith, the helmet, what? Salvation, that's not getting saved. That's the third component. Salvation is in three components. Salvation is a big word in the Bible. Phase one is your justification. Phase two, that's, that's you're saving the penalty of sin, death, hell, and lake of fire. Save two is sanctification in time. You've been made free from sin. Now live in that deliverance that you have. Live in that set apart, sanctified, living Live, in that, live that resurrection life of Christ. Phase three is, takes place at death of the rapture, glorification, the exaltation. And the helmet, 1 Thessalonians 5, is that hope, that phase three. You've got a future. I tried to talk about, with you that last night. You've got a future. There's something to look forward to. And that gives that, that hope. Faith, hope, charity, the work of faith, the labor of love, and the patience of hope. The thing that energizes you is faith in God's word. The thing that motivates you is the love of Christ and the thing that sustains you in the battle. Protects your thinking, pro protects your noggin. <laughs> if, you're, if you get your, your helmet knocked off in football, it can be bad. In the warfare, it can be deadly. All that's defensive. Then it says, take the sword of the spirit and go to work with the business end. The business end of the spirit is the word of God. When the word of God works, it's with his, it's with the sword. The sword works. Genesis chapter one. Always, it's fascinating to me. You can't get past everything you need to know. Three verses in your Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, darkness upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, God's going to move in his creation. And what does he do? And he said, 
When God wants to work, he speaks. When he wants to work, he works through his word. You learn that in three verses in the Bible. That's important to know. That sword, come with me to the book of Job. I want you to look at just, just two illustrations of, of, of interesting things to me. And I'll say like this, this is interesting to me. If it's not to you, then just hang on. We'll talk about something else later. Get Jeremiah 48 in one hand. And Job chapter 40. Jeremiah 48 and Job chapter 40. In Job chapter 40... Job, uh, the Lord, not Job, the Lord is describing to Job a character that's call, that he calls the behemoth. Now, without going into a long story about it, the behemoth is, in, in prophecy, is the Antichrist. Look at verse number 19, talking about the behemoth. He is the chief of the ways of God. He, have, he that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Now when you read the thing all down through there, it's obvious that nobody can, can lick this guy. And what he's telling, the one that made him can make his sword approach him. The only thing that can defeat the adversary is God's word. It's the sword. In Ephesians, it's the spiritual warfare. And the only thing that's going to, you can have all these other things protect you, but that one thing goes out and you can lick him with. Don't try to beat the adversary. Don't go into battle with him in your life on the daily basis or in, without the book. That's why you got to have the book. Because it's the book, it's the sword, is the word. Now look at Jeremiah 48. And I just, these are just two illustration, illustra illustrative verses that for me dem demonstrate the importance of God's word. Jeremiah 48, verse 10. Now this is a, I'm going to use this verse in a metaphorical way. We live in a day when, when you, you, you can't say anything honestly, without being careful, somebody's going to misunderstand it. You know, when I was coming up, if we talked about having a gay old time, it don't mean anything like, you know, people today think about gay. You know, somebody took that word and just perverted it into something bad. But they've been doing that all along. What's the fourth book in the New Testament called? John? If you go, out, go to the grocery, go to the, uh, Gas station next door, what do they call the restroom? My, my initials are CR. If you're in the Philippines, you know what you call the restroom? The CR. Comfort room. <laughs> you can make anything out of anything. So here when we talk about sword, we're going to talk, we're, I'm going to use this in the Ephesians 6, 17. I'm not trying to suggest to you that you need to take a sword and go cut somebody's head off. We clear about that? Yeah, you, ten years ago, you wouldn't have to set it. I'm going to set it now to get it on the record. We're not promoting physical violence against anybody. Now, I know you look at me and think, well, why are you saying that? But I guarantee you. Do you, know, you know, my mouth is, is, is insured. And my wife's... Alex Kurz, the other pastor at Shorewood, and, and me, our mouth is insured for about $10 million. I don't get any ideas. You, 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 you wouldn't want a case. The insurance company said, you're on the TV, six, you're on the television, you're on the radio six days a week, you've got some broadcast out over the internet, around the world, you've got a, you've got a church building and so forth. You better, we better insure you. Because I could, if, I, if I read Romans chapter 1, which I do, on the radio, their people could get mad and call it hate literature. In fact, it is in the state of Illinois, raw, Romans chapter 1, in the official platform of one of the two national parties, political parties, Romans chapter 1 is hate literature. Identified as such. They don't give the reference, but the, talk, the, the, the topics. So you have to kind of be, that's what I'm saying, you, you know, you got to kind of understand that. Look at this, sir. 
Jeremiah 48, verse 10. Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and holdeth, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. You do the work of the Lord deceitfully when you take that sword of the Spirit and you don't use it. I used to preach on the street a lot years ago. I, 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 I still do a little bit of that, but not, not as much. But when I, I, when I did a lot of street work, I found that if I took the book and I deal with somebody, I could take, I could take verses and they're here and I could move them right over there. Verses will move people around in their thinking if you use the verses. And I used to think about it, I'm stick them, stick them, jump over here and stick them here. I'm trying to get them over to the cross. <laughs> you do the work of the Lord deceitfully, you got no power with people. Cursed be he that doeth. You know, you know one of the problems in evangelical fundamental so-called Bible-believing Christianity for the past hundred years is people have abandoned the book as a source. People believe doctrinal statements I don't believe the book that got the doctrine out of. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God. God the Holy Spirit is going to work through His Word. Now, you might not disagree with that. You might say, hey, Brother Rick, you're preaching to the choir. I hope I am. But you need to understand that's the issue. That book is the way God the Holy Spirit is going to work. Go back with me to Ephesians. And... Look with me, if you will, at chapter 3. Ephesians chapter number 3. Paul's praying here. There are two prayers in the book of Ephesians. Chapter 1, he prays that your eyes of your understanding might be enlightened. In this prayer, he's going to pray that, that, that the believers might be empowered. Verse number 16, he says, that here's what he prays. That he, will, he, that is God the Father, would grant unto you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened by, with might by his Spirit, where? In the inner man. God the Holy Spirit is going to work in your inner man. That's where God works today. Now, if you go back to Israel's program, it's different. When you rightly divide the word... The issue is not the similarities, it's the distinctions that matter. People say, well, they had the Holy Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit, they're filled with the Spirit, we're filled with the Spirit. See, it's all the same, but it's not. In Acts 2, when they were filled with the Spirit, they spake as the Spirit gave them utterance. Matthew chapter uh, 10, Mark chapter, was it, 9, where Christ gives them their first great commission. He says, don't worry about what you're going to preach. Don't worry about what you're going to say. You're going to be hauled up in front of people, and the, the Spirit will give you the words to speak. Mark even says, don't premeditate what you're going to say. Lord, Lord, have mercy. These guys that are preached around here today, they've been premeditating. They've been thinking, meditating, studying, getting it together, thinking about it. The idea that I'll just open my mouth and let her fly, and the Spirit will give me something to say, that's good Pentecostal doctrine. <laughs> That's not Paul. That's right. Jeremiah chapter 31 says he's going to write his law in their heart. Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel 38, 36, he says, I'll put my spirit in you and cause you direct empowerment from the spirit of God that produces. Here he says, and by the way, a lot of outward stuff. Work over there. By the way, if, if you were of Deuteronomy chapter 11, covenant bought, blood bought covenant person of God out of Deuteronomy chapter 10, Deuteronomy 28, you can go out there and pray that prayer, that, 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 that uh, storm away. Kenny Copeland tried to do that to get the COVID not to show up. How'd that work out? Ronald, oh, Ronald Reagan. What's the guy's name? Donald Trump. He had an evangelical council. Do you see these guys praying? And they're all down around old Don. He's down there. And they're all praying on him. Trying to, everybody trying to touch him. You know, Paula White. That crowd. Yeah. She said, she's a big healer, if you, in case you don't know who she is. She said, COVID has been rebuked and shall not touch the shores of America. <laughs> How'd that work out for Don? He got it. 
I had COVID November a year ago. I was in the hospital. The doctor comes in. He says, now, you, know, you, you got it and so forth. Hear it in your lungs and all. We're going to give you the Trump treatment and you'll be great again soon. Well, you know why they gave me the Trump treatment? Because he had it. Well, how'd that prayer rebuking COVID, how'd that work out? Yeah, not, 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 not so good, did it? You think about all these healers. I wonder what they're talking about now. You know what this pandemic's done? It's demonstrated the, the falsehood, mm -hmm. the vacuousness. And all these little evangelicals trying to run around and say, oh, you know, it? to be like them. It just demonstrated being, they're, they're just clouds without wind. Nothing. Because when it comes down to, if it's true, you don't get, your tr you don't get truth out of your circumstances. You get truth out of that book. But if it's true, it'll confirm itself in your circumstances. And when you're claiming that stuff, and it wasn't you, it's not what, you've never been big enough a day in your life to make God do something he's not doing. And you can claim all the verses in the Bible about what God did in time past or what he's going to do in the ages to come. If it's not what he's doing now, you're not going to force him into doing it. Rightly dividing the word isn't. Listen, there's only one spirit, Holy Spirit. There's only one Jesus Christ. There's only one blood. There's only one, there's only one a lot of things. But then there's a lot of distinctions. And it's the distinctions that make the difference. So don't let somebody come along and say, well, you know, Jesus is going to come. He's going to come. Must be the same coming. So, well, over here, he's going to come and he's going to gather the saints. He's going to come get us and gather us, are, the, are gathering together to him. But boy, did you ever notice the differences? Matthew 24, when he gathers the elect, there's no resurrection. Angels, plural, gather the elect. The elect happen to, happens to be Israel, by the way. When the Lord comes to us, there's a resurrection. That's part of the gathering. There are no angels. There's one angel. All of a sudden you say, differences? Sure there are differences. He's coming. That's the same. But it ain't the same coming. <laughs> it's the distinctions that make the difference. Well, in your Bible, when you're studying the Scripture... It's important to make those distinctions and understand that, that in Israel's program, the empowerment of the believer, the leadership of the believer, the activity was done one way because Israel's program is, is the, the goal of prophecy is to bring the headship of Jesus Christ on the planet, on planet Earth into reality through a, the, a kingdom that's vested in the nation Israel. To bring about a kingdom and a nation in a land requires a bunch of physical activity. God told Abraham, you're going to have a son, a seed. He's 99 years old. He hadn't got the seed yet. Well, he was, he was younger than this, about 75. He didn't have the seed yet. He and Sarah talking about it one evening. She says, you know, I think you're the problem, dude. And I can prove it. There's Hagar. Try it. He does. And you know what happens? He has a seed. He can do it. You know what God said? That ain't it. That's not, my, that's not the seed ever. You did that. I'm not going to do your, what you do. I'm going to give it to you. You messed up. Just sit down, shut up, and wait. Then he comes to Abraham. He says, okay. It's time to have this. Abraham says, I can't have a kid. Sure, I can't have a kid. I go home and tell her we're going to have a baby. She's going to throw me on the porch. The Lord says, shut up. Go have a kid. You know what he did? I can understand why when he came and told Sarah that was going to happen, she laughed at him. Think about that. But you know what, you know what they had to have? They had to have a seed. And you know what it requires to have a kid. They had some physical activity that they had to do to get the promise done. Why? Because that's what God told them to do. If you can grasp that, you can understand why there are physical activities connected with the salvation of the nation, the nation Israel. Because for Israel, salvation is not the issue of justification. Abraham was already a justified man when he did these things. He had to do the works in order to accomplish the purpose God had for the justified man. 
So when you hear about salvation in the Old Testament, think, what salvation are we talking about? He that, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's not an issue of justification. That salvation package is so much bigger. That's why he says, he that believes not shall be damned. Because faith was what got him the justification. The war, the baptism is what got him into the little flock that, that, that is the group that's going to get the kingdom. Now, I, this is not in my notes here. This is, I'm just ad-libbing. But you have to understand, there's, there are activities in Israel's program that aren't involved in our program. The way the Spirit of God works and what He's accomplishing. How He works, where He works, where is He working in that verse? He strengthens you with might, mighty miracle working power. Where? In your inner man. He's not out there, he's not out there moving coal fronts. He's not moving zeros in the end of your bank account. He's not changing your, your love life and your, your finances and your health. God Almighty doesn't care if you drive a rusted out Toyota or, or, or a Lexus or, or a, what's it, a, a Tesla. He doesn't care about that. Now, he cares if you can pay for it. That's what he cares about. You don't, know, you don't want to know what God thinks about money and the dispensation of grace? Write down Ephesians 4 verse 28 and go read it. He'll tell you. You, do what he's, you, deal, you deal with the way he tells you to deal with it now. You know what he thinks about money in, in the earth of the ministry of Christ? Sell what you have and give it, give it to the poor. <laughs> Try to get somebody to preach that one of these meetings. Name it, claim it meetings. They like to go back to the Old Testament for that. Because in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's not a good thing to be rich. He says, scarcely shall a rich man enter the kingdom. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That's not good news. Nothing wrong with being rich. Abraham was rich. But in that kingdom program, there's an issue there. Go, go back with me to Ephesians. Ephesians 3.16 that he would grant you according to the riches of his grace, of his glory, I'm sorry, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. He's going to, you have his spirit in your inner man and the strengthening for your life as a believer is going to be in your inner man. And the means by which that's going to be accomplished is that sword of the spirit, that word of God. God works in your life. And by the way, if you look at Ephesians 6 again, and hang on to chapter 3, 1 Thessalonians 2, he says, it's that the word of God effectually works in you that believe. That word work is the word energy, energizing. In fact, the word that's translated work there is, is the word we get our, our word energy from, energero. That's where we get the word energy in English. If you want the spiritual energizing of your life, the, that inner compulsion in your life to have the Word of God, let the word, word of God work, you believe it. You trust it. We've talked about that all day today. So the empowerment of the Spirit of God is, is using His Word, working in your inner man when you believe it. The other thing in Ephesians 6, <clears throat> verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and, uh, and supplication for all the saints, and for me, that others begin. It's the Word of God in prayer that energizes, the Holy Spirit uses to energize the life of a believer. The Word of God is the energizing element. Prayer is the taking of God's, prayer is not, oh God, would you stop that storm coming? Oh God, would you, would you heal Aunt, Aunt Tilly's toenail? Oh God, would you help us pay this? It's not that kind of stuff. Listen, God's not a vending machine in the sky. If you put enough quarters in, pull the lever, right lever, and you get, you get a uh, pack of M&Ms, it's not, it's not what prayer is. That's not who he is. He's not a satellite up there where you go, ping, and, you know, there, there's a problem all the time. Well, ping, ping, the, ping, ping something off him, ricochet down and, and zap the problem. It's not what, what prayer is. That's not who God is, not who you are. Prayer is you talking to God about what's going on in your life, the concerns, the supplications, the prayers, the things that, are, that, that, are, that you're facing. Talking to God about those things, how would God talk back to you about them? In the book. So you're taking what, you, you've got a problem, you've got an issue, and you, you go to his word, what does his word say about that? 
and then you take what his word says and then you apply it to the circumstance and you use the creative genius that God has given you, empowered by his spirit, educated by his word, and that activity of doing that transforms your thinking, energizes your life, motivates you. And then you come back, do it again. And prayer is the energizing implementer. It's the thing that, imp that, 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 that uh, it's the mechanism that triggers, the catalyst that triggers the empowering of God's word in the details of your life. When you think about, you think about life, you think day in and day out, do, do you realize that God hears everything you say? There's nothing you've ever thought that God didn't hear it. Only two people in all the universe know everything you ever said. You've forgotten most of it. He didn't forget any of it. People ask, can the devil read your mind? No. But God can. You understand, when you have a thought about, you worry about something. You feel dejected about something. You feel, and you say, I guess I should pray about it. You're a little late. God already heard, heard all you're thinking about it. When you learn to think about what you think about in the, in, in, in the, in the consciousness of you're doing it in the presence of Almighty God. So quit just think, well, I wonder if I should pray about this. Like he wasn't there. See, when you understand who you are, you understand this constant, uninterrupted communion and fellowship you have with the Father through his Son. That's why it's important to understand all this identity stuff and, and, and the totality of your forgiveness and the completeness of your identity so that you understand you've got a relationship with God himself that nobody in the Bible outside of Jesus Christ ever thought of having. Amen. Moses never thought about having a relationship that was that intimate. Abraham never thought about it. They never had it. Right. You've been given a great privilege as a member of the body of Christ. And when you live day by day with that consciousness, all of a sudden that sword of the Spirit becomes more important. Because here's an issue, and I don't know what God's Word says about it. So what do you do when you don't know? You always know what to do when you don't know. What do you do? Stop and go find out. <laughs> How hard is that? Here's something I don't know what to do. My son is a building contractor. He remodels stuff. And I'm amazed at his skill. He just never seems to have a, a problem he can't figure out an answer to. So I'm, I'm asking him about, the, he says, oh, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> he said, anything, anything that you, you, you need to do, you just you search it on YouTube and you'll find five different ways to do it. Then you figure out the one that works. And I thought, wow, isn't that, isn't that handy? Where, where, where's YouTube? <laughs> My problem is I try, I have to have instructions. Alan Frith over here, I, he, I used to watch him fix lawnmowers and stuff. I'd do it and I'd have three parts left over. He would do it. He didn't read anything. He just looked, he just had an, you know, that, that uh, ability to fix it. Know how, know how it works. My, my youngest son's that way. I'd have directions to put a piece, you know, now you buy furniture, it's always in a box. Lord have mercy. <laughs> I'll, I, have, I have a piece of, I have a little cabinet in my, in my, in my office, in my study. One, that, one of the shelves in it is, put, is, on, is on upside down and backwards. I put that thing together three times. Every time, going exactly by the instructions. Got things wrong every time. The last time I said, it's just going to stay that way. I wasn't going to take it. Because if I take it two-thirds apart to get the thing right, I said, it, it ain't worth it. It's mine. I'll just forget it. Don't worry about it. It doesn't bother me. Now, other people come and say, oh, that's kind of strange. Why'd you do that, Brother Rex? I said, oh, just because I'm great. <laughs> I just demonstrate my patience. In your life, that's what prayer is about. And it's used as, a, as, a, as an empowering element to empower the truth of God. So God the Holy Spirit is going to work and he's going to empower your life. And it's the word and prayer that does it. That's why at the end of the, at the, end of the, the armor is the sword of the Spirit. And then what, what, what is the 
attitude with which you wield the sword, all prayer for everything. There shouldn't be any more. When Paul says pray without ceasing, he's saying don't let any area of your life, anything you think about, be done outside of a consciousness that you're doing in the presence of, of God. Now, you know what happens? Now, you think about that, and this is why it's scary. Because if there's something comes up, and you say, I'm sure to do that, and you know it ain't right. And you know who you're asking, and he's standing there, and he, uh, you know, okay. You see how that would begin to frame the things you do? Because you're doing what? You're bringing the truth of God's word into the details of your life. And by faith, this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to fight that good fight of faith to do this. But talking to God in his presence. You know, how, guys, you know how much harder it is to do something you shouldn't do when your wife's standing there looking at you. Now, don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. And she knows, too. That's why she's looking over your shoulder. Well, when you, when you have the God of heaven, the creator, that's a wonderful relationship. You've got a tremendous privilege. And it's the sword of the spirit that's the business end of that, whereby the Holy Spirit's going to work in your life and produce that kind of thing. Look at chapter, well, let's don't do that. Go, go back to verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 17. He calls it the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I want you to look with me at chapter 3. I want you to see what this issue about the Word of God and what, what that's about. When you, when you try to teach people about what the Bible is, you try to the process and who it is, here's a, here's a, here's a place, and, and th this kind of stuff is done in the Bible very casually. Not because it's a casual topic, because it, but, but because it's just so obvious that the Bible expects you to just see it as obvious. Chapter 3, for this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, now watch, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four in, free wor in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge. See the process? By revelation, he made known to me the mystery. God revealed, he spoke, he made known to the Apostle Paul. Come with me to first, hold on, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. That's what we call inspiration. All scriptures give inspiration. That's, inspiration starts with the issue of revelation. Not called inspiration, it's called revelation. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now here's a passage of scripture that is, that's marvelously maligned. 1 Corinthians 2 verse number 9. But as it is written, and this is from the book of Isaiah, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. I hadn't seen, everything you know, you know in one of three ways. I have not seen. That's empirical evidence. Ear had not heard. That's rational, reasoning, logical evidence. Heart hath not. It, uh, heart had, it hadn't entered the heart. With the heart, man believes. That's faith evidence. You know things. B believe the science. Says the quacks. No scientist would say believe the science. Every scientist would say, question the science, because that's what science is about, is questioning the assumptions. That's how science moves forward, question the assumptions. Uh, one of the brothers this morning was talking about leadership. And good leaders never have to be uh, bosses, authoritative, how you said it. And I've, I've been telling people all through this pandemic thing, if you can persuade people, you don't have to mandate something. If you have the, if you have the argument that will persuade people voluntarily follow you. If you have to mandate it, force them, then you don't have the, you don't have the argument. Because people will be persuaded if you'll persuade them. 
And I thought that was, Kevin did that, I thought, wow, that, that's, a, that's a real thought. He's doing it in business and spiritual things. It's that way everywhere. I, ear, heart, empiricism, logic, faith. All the ways you can know things, you can't know what God's doing. Billy Graham wrote that, used that in a, in a newspaper article, book years ago. Said, "See, God works in mysterious ways, as wonders to perform. You can't know." But look at that next verse. But you ever anybody stand up and say, oh, "I'm gonna get up today. Oh God, I'm gonna pray today that you just. I'm, gonna, I'm praying you'll just show me today what you've prepared for me." That's the verse they use. That's 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 nutball praying not Bible praying. But, look at verse 10. God hath revealed them to us. You can't know them on your own, but God has already revealed it to you by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So the things you can't know on your own, God has already revealed. Everything He has prepared for you is in that book. You don't need to run around in your circumstances and say, oh, did God prepare that for me? Did God prepare that? I had a young boy one time come to me, about nine years old. And he said, Brother Rick, what was God, my brother, a little older than him, had gotten killed in a car wreck. He said, what was God trying to teach me my, my, by my brother dying in that car wreck. And I looked at that little boy and... You understand what he's asking? That's the religious question. I said, son, God isn't trying to teach you anything. God doesn't kill people to teach you something. Everything he wants you to know is in that book right there. So let's sit down here and talk about what the book says. God isn't doing things in, out in the circumstances of your life to try to teach. The circumstances of your life is the stage in which you live. He teaches you in his word. Then you take what he teaches you in his word and you go out and live it on that stage. That's the way God designed it. He reveals. How? By his spirit. God rejoices to be known as the God that reveals himself. The famous atheist, the guy, what was the guy that was in a wheelchair? Just died. Hawkins. Who? Hawkins. Hawkins. Hawkins, that's it. I, I can never remember his name. <coughs> Someone asked him one time, why? Every a Hutchins, uh, Hitchens, all these, they all were believers before they became atheists. Because Romans says, one says that's what everybody is. And he said, they ask you, if, 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 you, if you die and, and, you, and, and there's, there is a God and you meet him, what are you going to say to him? He said, I, well, I guess I'll say, sir, why did you make yourself so hard to find? Duh. I couldn't see you, Lord. I didn't, why did you to make it so hard for me to find you? I couldn't see you. What an what a, what a, what an educated, he's educated way beyond his capacity to understand life. I told him I don't have a real estate behind my ears to take my glasses off, so I took them off. God reveals himself. He said, he revealed, this information came from God. I didn't figure it out, but go back to Ephesians. So it starts out with revelation. Now, if he told Paul, how are we going to hear it? I wrote it down. Now there is in scripting, scripture. So he takes the revelation that Christ gives him over a period of time, didn't come all at once. And he said, I wrote what God told me, I wrote it down. By the way, you ever hear anybody talk about you can't translate from one language to the other perfectly? That's such, a, that's such an interesting thing. Take arguments like that and apply them and look for an answer in the Bible. Not in a translating class. If God speaking deity words 
the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they communicate with words. If they take words that they understand, their language, translate it into the Greek language that Paul understood, where's the translation problem? Isn't the real problem done? You understand what Paul wrote when he wrote Greek was a translation from deity words to human words. God doesn't think it's a problem to translate from one language to another and fully, adequately communicate the, the meaning. Otherwise, the original writing wouldn't be fully adequate. That's why in Acts chapter 20, 21, my mind tells me, Paul stands in front of the Jewish ports there, preaches to them Hebrew. Luke wrote it down in Greek, 22 verses. God, the Holy Spirit, didn't think it was a problem to translate from Hebrew to Greek, put it in his word and said, it's perfect. Because we all believe the original manuscripts are perfect, don't we? And it's a translation of some, you know, over 20 verses. If God thought he could do that, I think it can be done. Now you can argue and say, you don't think, but I got a verse that indicates to me, I'm gonna believe, believe it happened like that verse. Now I know that the, tra the translators that we do aren't inspired, I, got, I understand that. I'm not trying to say they are. I'm just saying it's possible to go from one language to the other if you do it consistently and correctly. So all this stuff about you can't have the, you can't have the Bible in anything but the original language is not biblical. It's theological. It's man's view of what happened, not God's view. Paul said, he revealed this stuff to me, and I wrote it down. That's the book. Now I've got it in written form. This is why the Bible issue is an issue. That's why I said Willard is one of my heroes. Because when it came to that issue, you're not going to move him. Stand right there. Don't be with, don't with, withstand the attempt to push you away. I didn't start out a King James believer. I started out with, I got saved, start, got, started using an American Standard Version. Early on, I was working at the Mobile Rescue Mission. I was, I was in, started in high school. When I was in college, I lived there. Ms. Reynolds, Brother Reynolds, that, that ran the place, they were grace believers, by the way. But they also understood the King James Bible issue. We'd meet in the morning and have prayer before I'd go to school and she'd go to work and, 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 and have some scripture reading. And she would literally weep over me using that ASV. I finally had enough of that and said, if you're going to keep doing that, you're going to have to explain to me what's wrong. So she said, well, here, here's a verse that bothers me. Luke 2, 33. Her Bible, said, uh, her Bible said, Joseph and his mother marveled. My Bible said his father and his mother. It bothered her that the Holy Spirit, when he wrote Luke 2.33, called Joseph, said his father instead of Joseph. I went and got my Greek text out, and my Greek text said father. Then I looked up in the dictionary in another book and found her Greek text said Joseph. Two different Greek texts. Oh, not a translation, it's a text issue. So then she says, well, here's another one. Matthew 5, 22. Jesus says, whosoever is angry with his brother is in danger of the judgment. My Bible said that. Mark chapter 3, Jesus looked around the Pharisees with anger. What does that mean? Jesus in danger. He condemned himself. Her Bible said, if any man is angry with his brother without a cause, is in danger of the judgment. Well, Mark, when he said he looked around with anger, Angry because of the hardness of the heart. He had a reason. So I said, hmm, I need to look into that. Because she got a couple of verses that bothered her that began to bother me too. So I went back to school, and the head of the literature department was a guy named Dr. Tom Hart, taught Sunday school at the First Baptist Church in Mobile, and he used the RSV. So I said, Dr. Hart, and I showed him these verses. He said, oh, it's just, that's, just, that's just stuff. That's not true. This, this, this is the best manuscripts. That's just misunderstanding. You know, look down verse, a few more verses. Mary calls him your father and I. And, uh, but see, Ms. Reynolds said, I wasn't Mary saying it to cover up for, for his dad. That's the Holy Spirit wrote that. 
So that argument didn't help me much. And then I started reading and noticing, and I came across my verses, Mark 1, 2, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. My Bible said it is written in the prophets. Why would it say prophets? Because he then quotes Malachi. Well, Malachi ain't in Isaiah. <laughs> He goes Malachi and Isaiah. That's why it says prophets. I went to Dr. Hart and said, Dr. Hart, what about that? He says, ah, oh, that's not worried about that. that that's, this, is, this is the new Isaiah exit. It's all this theological stuff. And I said, yeah, but it's still there. He said, textual, textual issue. Okay. He said, beside that, let me show you something. Luke chapter 2. Eight days old, Jesus is. Mary and Joseph take him to the temple. What do you do with a Jewish boy when he's eight days old? Have him circumcised. Circumcised the eighth day, according to Paul said. Leviticus 12. But Luke, Luke 2 says he, that it was done for her purification. But my ESV said for their purification. Did the baby Jesus need a sacrifice for purification? No. But according to that book, what does that mean? According to his a RSV and my ASV, Jesus was a sinner. In need of purification, the little turtle dove sacrificed for him. I said, so I began to study and began to find out I was in, you know, I was not just in the wrong pew, I was in the wrong building. <laughs> so it is an issue Amen. because I want to know what God wrote. Now, once you've got it, by the way, when he says, preach the word, if you don't know you have it, you don't know what you're preaching. Okay? Look, look at the rest of that verse. As I wrote in a few words, whereby when you read, you need to be able to read. You know what I can do? I can read what Christ told Paul. It isn't lost. Isaiah chapter 29 says in the kingdom over here, way beyond us, the words that Isaiah wrote back there in Isaiah 29 are going to be read in that kingdom. You know what that means? They're going to have to be preserved from back there all the way over here. And goodness, I'm in here between that. We call that preservation. Isaiah 30, verse 8. The Lord says to Isaiah, go, write it in a, in a book, in a table, a tablet. Put it in a book. That it might be for the generations to come forever and ever. You write it down to preserve the record. I say something. Someone sent me an email this afternoon. Said, yesterday on that podcast that, you, that Joel and Fred had, you said so and so. And I said, you sure? Well, I heard it. I said, I didn't. And I was the one talking. So you know what you can do? We can argue about it. But fortunately, now we have records. They have a tape recording of it. And we can go find out whether I did or I didn't. I either did or I didn't, but I don't remember doing it, and he does, so way to pass. But if you've got a record, so you write it down so it can be preserved so other people can get it. Paul said, I want this, what I'm writing in this epistle read by all the churches. Aren't you glad? Because we're part of all the churches been preserved all the way for us. But notice while, now let's get to while this is there. Whereby you, you, when you read, you may what? What does it take to understand God's word? We're not Bible packers. We're Bible students. Bible believers. A lot of folks took the book around. I got the book, I got the book, I got the book. And they pack it around like a backpack. They don't crack it open and read it. If they did, they don't understand it because they don't write it divided. <coughs> Whereby when you read, you may understand. God wants you to, reading it, and under, the understanding comes from reading. What Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, verse 7, consider what I say, and the Lord do what? Give the understanding in all things. Understanding spiritual things comes from reading God's Word. Now that doesn't mean not, I'm, I'm not talking, you can't just hear it too. 
but you need to get in the book and get the book in you. Because the understanding that you need to be able to fight the good fight of faith, to war the warfare that's ours, is going to come out of, your, out of that book, and it's going to come out of the understanding that you can have out of that book. Let, let me give an illustration, and I'll be through. First, come with me to 1 John chapter 2. When you study your scripture, you find that the attacks come. We talk about the world, the flesh, and the devil. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15. Love not the world, and neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the thing, love of the Father is not in him. Now, somebody said, oh, wait a minute, you're not in Paul's epistles. There's a lot of information in the Bible outside of Paul's epistles Paul expected you to know. Don't get the idea that you just read Paul's epistles. God told me one time, said, oh, you guys just throw out everything west of Romans. I, mean, I wasn't sure, sure what that meant, I just, but I, I, I can imagine. If you ever get the idea that all you can ever read and study is, is Romans to Philemon, read the first verse of the book of Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Who's Jesus Christ? You're not going to find out who he is just by reading the book of Romans. Separated to the gospel of God. Who's God? What God? Which God? Wouldn't you need Genesis 1-1 for that? How about 1 John 5-7? See, Paul all expects the readers already to know those things. Knowing those things, here's some more information. Separated so the gospel of God. Promised afore, in this whole scripture, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, who, who was born of the seed of David. Who in the world is that? So there's all kind of information in the Bible that's pertinent to you to, for you to know so you can understand what he's doing in the dispensation of grace. It never say you don't study all the Bible. You do study it all. You just understand where you are in it. Here's how the world, the will of God the Father is to deliver you from this present evil world. How does the evil world work? Here it is. For, the, for all that is in the world, verse 16, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the, of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth for, forever. So what, what the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. So if I'm out here in the world, I'm going to be attacked by the world system, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. So what do I do? I need to get me some fortification so that when the lust of the flesh comes, i got something to nail it. One of the brothers this morning told me you need to have some verses to, you know, in your mind. What I do is I, I have verses. The lust of the flesh. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the lust thereof and affections thereof, Galatians 5. And when the lust of the flesh come, the drawing, the pulling, the desires, Eve sees the fruit and it's, it, she sees it's good for food. Well, when that comes, you look at it and you say, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin. and Made me free from the law of sin and death. Why? Because I've crucified the flesh. Where did I crucify him? I didn't do it. My flesh was crucified with Christ at Calvary. I'm crucified with him. That's why I need to know who I am. What happened to me when I got saved? What happened to me when I got saved? It was way more than just getting my sins forgiven. That's pretty good. It was wonderful to know I wasn't going to die and go to hell. I spent six months scared, lifeless. As just a young teenager, praying every night, Lord, don't let me die tonight. If I die, I'm going to die and go to hell, and I don't know what to do about it. So when I got saved, forgiveness was a wonderful thing. But I started reading my Bible, and I found out I got a whole bunch more good things, Amen. and a lot more shiny things than just forgiveness. Because as you grow, and you find out, I got a new identity. And I got, I got circumcised in the body of the sons of the flesh through what I had in Christ. Now, I woke you up, see? Now when the flesh comes calling, 
I can look at it and say, I'm free from you. Man, come, come, come after a meeting. He said, can I talk to you, Rick? And I said, sure. We sit down. He said, I won't do it in private. We sit down. And he says, I'm an alcoholic. And I can't quit drinking. And I said, I, I got a testimony of salvation from him. I said, say that again to me. He said, I'm an alcoholic. I said, you're, I, listen, if you're going to sit there and lie to me, I, we're, we're through. He said, I'm not lying. I said, yeah, you are. He said, no, I can't quit. I said, what's that verse say? He that is dead is free. Now, are you, are you, are you right or God right? You come home with an angry disposition and you want to kick the cat because you're scared to kick your, kick your wife. It ain't because you have to. It's because you don't believe that verse. Okay? So what do I need to do? I need first to put the verse in my mind. I'm free from sin. What it, listen, I've got this propensity that wants to go over here and do this, be angry. Be lustful, be covetous, be discontent, whatever it is. You know, I look around a room like this, and you know, I, you're probably not most of you anyway are probably not engrossed and bound by the by the, the, the more obvious outward sins. Somebody says, "Well, I believe you have to. You can't sin anymore." Well, what is a worse sin than pride? Seven things. He says he, 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 he hates. Booze isn't one of them. By the way, pornography isn't one of them. Cocaine isn't one of them. Pride is. You see, we, we get these outward things. Any of those three that I just mentioned are terribly addictive. But you're free from them. How do you know? I got a verse. You say, but the verse ain't working. I trust you're not believing it. How do I know? I got a verse that says it works if you believe it. Who's right? The verse or you? If you get your heart filled with what it means to be dead to sin, made dead to sin, if you get your heart filled with what you heard that first message this morning about the law of the sin, when it says law there, it's talking about an operating principle like the, the, the law of gravity. It always works. The law of aerodynamic lift can overcome the law of gravity, but there's still the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit, the way the spirit works is the life is in Christ. Has made me free. How? You're dead to sin. You've got to live the life of Christ. And in Philippians 3, when Paul talks about, I want to live that resurrection life. So when I'm not living it, whose fault is it? See, grace puts you on the spot. Grace says, you're free. And if you ain't acting like it, it's your fault. It's because you love your sin, yourself, whatever it is you're after, more than you love him. But we already knew that. But the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge. We begin to think the way the, cross, the, way the obedience of Christ thinks. Okay? The lust of the eyes. I see the pearly thing. She sees the fruit. I see the shiny little thing. I think I want that. We walk by faith, not by sight. For the things that are seen are temporal, the things that are not seen are eternal. So when I see that, I say, you know what? That isn't going to last. Not going to last. I got a guy, a friend in Chicago, he says, you only invest in things that appreciate in value. Don't buy a car, it goes down. Buy a house, it goes up. So how long is that house? You know, I know folks in Chicago, they lost their shirt in the last bubble. <laughs> Nothing always does something. But I can tell you something that never loses its value. There's some truth, some doctrine that never goes away. But when my eyes begin to, you know, put the thoughts in your head and the idea, I'm going to walk by faith, not by sight. I want to I I see something 
God's love is not tied to your finances, your romantic life, your health. It's not tied to all the things you see. It's tied to the cross. Look there. But if you don't have a verse in your mind to tell you where to start, I've told people for years, you, you've heard me, some of you, heard, most of you have heard me say this, there's never been a problem I've ever seen in life that I've ever experienced or that I've ever seen anybody else experience that the beginning of an answer wasn't in the 12th of Romans. In fact, I can guarantee you there's not a problem you face or ever will face that the answer isn't in the 12th of Romans because that's what it's there for. Now the whole panoply of the answer isn't going to necessarily be there, but the first steps will be. So what should you do when you have a problem? Oh, woe is me, what would Ann Landers say? Oh, I know what, I need to call Miss Jordan and ask her how to raise my kids. People do that. And she's a great source of information. Now she's going to be mad at me for telling you that because I'm not inviting you to call her. I'm just telling you that I know how grandma is. So I think I'll call her. Wouldn't it be better to call Paul? You like that show Call Saul? Better Call Saul. That's a great show. Better Call Paul. Try Romans 12. Get a passage in your mind. A plan ahead. Every answer, the beginning is going to be there. And you know what? When you, when you find the beginning, then you go on, when you're going to begin to look for the next step. You find that, you look for the next step. And pretty soon, you'll be like the guy that called up our office some time ago, talked to Brother Keeble. And, and he said, I just want to call somebody and tell him I'm going to kill myself. And Ray said, well, how are you going to do it? And he explained how he's going to do it, which is a pretty much sign that they're serious. And Ray said, well, before you do that, could I talk to you about something? And he got the Bible out and began to talk to him about the Lord. And the guy professed to be saved and actually turned out to have a t testimony of salvation. And he talked to him and he talked to him and he talked to him, went through scripture, scripture. And then Ray says, now, in the last half hour, have you been thinking about killing yourself? The guy said, well, no. Why? Well, we've been talking about the Bible. Wouldn't that maybe be a solution? Why, yeah, maybe it would. And you know what? The guy didn't kill himself. You know what he did? He enrolled in Grace School of the Bible. <laughs> now, that was the most unique sales pitch I'd ever, ever heard. But the answer is, put your mind on re the renewing of your mind. Then there's the pride of life. I deserve that. They shouldn't have done that to me. They had no right to do that to me. I deserve this. Pride. When pride comes your way, and it does repeatedly every day, if there's any one sin you commit over and over and over and over every day, it's that one. Somebody cuts you off. <laughs> you talk to other people in the drive of the car? Yeah, you do. I do. Hi, I'm glad you're still here. Let me let you in. <laughs> we, our church building is right on the freeway. You, Leave our parking lot, make one turn, you're up on the freeway. If you make that turn wrong, you'll get a hundred dollar ticket from the photo camera. But if you make it right, you can get up and you're on the freeway. People at the church, they're all happy, praising the Lord, singing the glory of God, studying the Bible, fellowship with the saints. In 30 seconds, they're back out. Mr. Magoo is out there. <laughs> Traffic in Chicago, there's one rule on the freeways in Chicago, you never use your brake. <laughs> If you use your blinker, you ain't never going to get in. The way you get in, change lanes, is you start, get your front wheels across the line, then put your blinker on. They know, you, you're gonna, they know what you're doing. Now you've told them, they'll let you in. But if you don't, and you just put a blinker, they'll say they're from Wisconsin, and we don't let them in anywhere. <laughs> right? <laughs> because they, the rule is, don't use your brake, because you'll get, you'll get 15 people killed. Well, that's just the, the, the etiquette of the rule. But you get out there and you start fighting. You know what that is? Well, I'm not letting him get in front of me. Yeah, that's called pride. A little simple thing like that, but it's one of the seven things God says he hates. So what do you do? How do you handle that? You see, your emotions give reality to your faith. 
With the heart man believes unto righteousness. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Your heart has volition, but it also has emotions. And the emotions take the things that you believe, the things you're, you're trusting in, and give them some sense of movement in your life. That's what emotions do. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Well, he's, not talking about, he's talking about the Jewish program he's under. He's talking about the thinking process. Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus, who though is in the form of God, thought it not Robert would be equal with the Father, made himself of no reputation. Here's, here's the celebrity of the universe. The Word, God the Son. The one in whom the Father puts all preeminence. And he made himself. If anybody had a right to strut his stuff, it was him. But his mindset was make himself with no reputation. The Father's got a plan, and I'm going to carry it out. And he's obedient. He's made in fashion as a servant, fashion as a man, lower than the angels, got to, right down to the bottom. He humbled him. People say, but theologians call the cross the, the, humilia the humiliation. The cross was not the humiliation. He humbled himself. You don't humiliate somebody when they, when they voluntarily do it. You humiliate them when you do it against their will. He humbled himself. No mark of pride at all. You know what kind of mindset you need to have? That one. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring every thought <laughs> into captivity to the what? Obedience of Christ. You need to have the mindset of Christ. Obedient to death. That's how you cast down imagination. That's how you bring pride. Think under control. Now if you have those verses already in your mind, you get yours. Those are mine. You can have, you can have them if you want them because they're in the Bible. Your Bible's got them in it. You can have them. But you need, to, you need to think ahead, get the armor on, get your sword ready, so when the attack comes, you get, <laughs> and cursed is he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, cursed is he that holdeth back his sword from blood, spiritually speaking. Use that book. Don't just say, I got it. Use it. Believe it. Trust it. It will work. It will bring the victory that you have in Jesus Christ and your identity and who you into the practice and experience of your life. Into the walk. Let me just give you one illustration and I'll quit. I mentioned working at the rescue groups. I, I was fortunate to start out the first time I ever preached was on a street corner. I, mean, I, I was studying the Bible. I was talking to people I, I went through all of my friends at school, in high school, uh, junior high and high school. They, 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 they didn't want to talk to me anymore because all I wanted to talk to was, was about the Bible. And I was talking to a guy at church, and he says, you know, Ricky, if two, cre if two streets cross and you're on one of them, the three empty corners. In other words, there's opportunities everywhere. Well, I, I didn't get the metaphor in that. I just, I just went downtown, found a street corner, still don't start preaching. Didn't, know, didn't have an idea what I was doing. But I wound up meeting people from around the Mobile Rescue Mission, inner city mission there in Mobile. I went around there, and uh, I said, wow, this is okay. I can play the piano, so I played the piano for, for the meetings, and they liked to have me there for that. Then, they found, then I got an opportunity to preach, and I discovered, boy, this is, this is for me. You could witness to people, see people get saved. It, wonderful, it, it, it's the most exciting thing. You'll, you get a taste of this, you, you'll, never, you'll never get away from serving the Lord. You get the taste of seeing someone's life totally transformed just like that, simply for trust in Christ. I could tell you story after story. Drunkards, thieves. Ross, somebody asked a while ago about does about have you ever been hit? Have had a gun held on you? Yeah. The, the, the only time I've the only time I've ever tasted beer, I threw it in my face because I was talking to her about the Lord. Things, th interesting things happen. I was, uh, anyway, we don't have time for all that. But the, I, the, the time I got hit, the only time I've ever been hit in the face, 
This guy, Bill Brusso, I was he, he was at, he, I was working living at the mission, working there, going to college, and he he was a guy who came and he was stayed because he'd been he had arm and shoulder broken, so he's staying there, and he was a lost guy, a uh, snapper boat captain, so he was a kind of a used to being in control kind of guy, but now he's having to you know stay there because he can't work, and if you, at the mission you had to go to gospel meeting in the morning, gospel meeting. if you're going to eat, you had to go to a gospel meeting. So after about three or four weeks of that, he'd had enough. He, he, he was under such conviction, I mean just terrible conviction. So I opened my door, rap, 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 opened the door, and all I saw was a fist coming. Bang! Hit me right in the chops, knocked me on the floor, slid me under the table, under the bed. And I look up, there's, there's, he's, he was a stocky guy. And I looked at him and said, Bill, why don't you just get saved? <laughs> I knew you were going to say something like that. <clears throat> and he stormed off. The next day he got saved. It was sort of the climax of the, of the, the conviction. He studied there, worked. About a year and a half later, he bought an old car, packed it with everything he could. And the last time I saw Bill, he was on his way to Guatemala, his hometown, his home to take the gospel to his family. Complete transformation. He was a snapper boat captain, Star Fish and Oyster Company. They would load these snapper boats up with enough rum to keep the guys out for three or four weeks. Because when the rum ran out, they came home. That's all he'd ever done. I mean, he was pickled. But he got saved, his whole life turned around. One guy, He's, a, he's there. His family come dump him out. He'd get drunk. Terrible. His family, Brother Reynolds used to say, why, why do they think we want him when he's drunk? <laughs> and Fred got saved. And he'd stand and give a testimony. He'd say, you know, I got saved. I got so, one, the night I got saved, I took a taxi home, and even the cat knew I was different. <laughs> he said, because I had never been home without kicking that cat off the porch. And that night I didn't. And his whole life was transformed. There's, a, there's an old gospel song uh, that, that the cathedrals used to sing about, uh, we don't live here anymore. Daddy comes home drunk, the little boy runs from his dad because he's always beating. And the song is, I got saved, and that daddy don't live here anymore. And when you see that, all you got to do is see it once. I can still remember the first person I ever sat and shared the gospel with and they got saved. I can still, I can still remember the, the aroma that was in the room. It's so exciting. You do that and all of a sudden, all the things you read about, you talk about, you think about, you hear about, you sing about, become life, become real. And you can't get away from it. Amen. That works in you because you believed it and you, and you brought it into your experience by faith. What I learned at the mission was there were only two things that worked. One was the blood of Christ. What are you going to tell a harlot? What are you going to tell, tell a drunkard? Quit whoring, quit drinking? They would if they could. The only thing that's going to liberate them is life in Christ. And the only thing going to get that to them is the blood. His blood, his blood is all my plea. Hallelujah for ransom me. And I've worked on the street. I've worked in the bank vault, bank president's offices, street corners. That's the only thing. I, I learned, thank God I learned early, religion won't do it. Tell them to reform. People say, you need to repent. Are you nuts? <laughs> what do you mean? Be sorry for your sin. Everybody's sorry they got caught. Brother said this morning, I wasn't sorry for my sin. I was enjoying it. <laughs> repent doesn't mean sorry for your sin. How sorry you got to be? In the Bible, repentance is a change of mind. Amen. What they mean is stop, quit, don't do it anymore. Turn from your sin. Well, maybe you turn from... Brother Reynolds used to say, somebody said, how many people, how many bums get saved and make a nosedive at the mission? He said, as many of them bums in your church that trust Christ. Because you, you can get drunker on pride than you can on a bottle of Smirnoff. You know, you can drink enough booze, it'll put you to sleep. 
you never drink enough pride, it won't kill you that way. I learned the gospel had to be the issue. And I learned that only the book was going to get the gospel to people. Yeah. I've seen people, we were, we were in a street meeting, and a, a, a naval officer comes walking down the street. And one of the guys that was, I was with, he, he's a, was it an old drunk, gotten saved. And this, he says something to the naval officer, and the guy mocks him. And he said, and this old boy, he stood there, he said, let me tell, let me tell you something, fella. Oh, how well do I remember as I, how I doubted day by day, and I did, could not remember. Oh, I, you remember, the interview? you know that song? I can't remember the words of it. But the chorus is, it's real, it's real, thank God it's real. And he sang that to that guy. Be grateful I'm not able to sing it. And he looked at him and said, what you got like that? And that naval officer stomped his foot and stomped off because he didn't have anything like that. You get on YouTube, look up the Atheist Ain't Got No Song. That's a great song, sung by an atheist. Atheists ain't got no, they got no hope. But it takes that book to get that through to them. And I've seen people with hard hearts from sin and rebellion and you just keep giving them that book. I don't believe in God. I know that's what the book. Look, here, here's why you don't believe in God. Here, and you show them wrong. And you show them. And you know what? That book gets them. Because that book is the sword of the Spirit. It'll penetrate the hearts. But it'll penetrate your heart. Because we're not talking about bums in the mission tonight. We're talking about a bunch of you. That book is what does God. You're strengthened by His Spirit in the inner man. That book does that. The Spirit of God takes that, that book and does that. So look at one, one last verse, and I'll quit lying to you, and I'll quit. <laughs> look at Romans 15, the verse we looked at last night, Romans 15, verse 13. If you went away from here this weekend and made this verse your verse for the year, I'd be real happy with you. And I know it's important to you that I'm happy with you. Now the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit of God takes that book, that information that he revealed, that he had written in a book that you can read, that will give you understanding about what he's doing and your part in it, and take that and fill you with joy and peace. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Appreciate who God's made you in Christ. Believe it and watch it work. Watch it take even somebody like you and transform them into a trophy of God's grace. Okay? Praise the Lord. Thanks for being patient all day long and for enduring to the end your Matthew 24, 13 saints. No, 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 no. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Is it 9 o'clock in the morning? I don't know what time we started in the morning. My wife and I probably need to sleep in because she's kept me up so late. Father, we thank you tonight for your love and your grace and the privilege of fellowshipping with these these. Uh, these saints around the truth of your word. We just pray that what we do this weekend might instill in us hearts of faith and trust and love and grace that stand in awe of the wonderful riches of the glory of your grace that we, that we rejoice in. May we not lay it aside. May we not let the world of flesh and the devil May we not let the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life push it out of our thinking, but may we fill our hearts with it. Desire thy word more than our necessary food, as Job did, and see it work for your glory. We thank you in his name. Amen.